What is going on everyone? My name is Andy. Welcome back to another FPL video. The last one for the 21-22 season and it's a special one. I am joined by the FPL champion, Jamie. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, Andy. Thanks for having me. Good stuff. So we're, we're going to go through, obviously, Jamie's season, talk about what it's like winning, all the key points, all your community questions as well. The first question is obvious. How does it feel? It, it It's still sinking in. It's been over a week, but um, you know, it's pretty cool. I think at the time that I won, I didn't quite feel the magnitude of exactly what it was. Um, you know, just felt like I was winning another competition and I wasn't very close a couple of weeks out. We'd probably talk about that, um, a bit more, but so it wasn't, didn't quite hit me right away over time as the community is, um, you know, talked about it, Twitter's blowing up. Um, it's kind of sunk in more and more. And I'm sure when I get to come out and go to a couple of games, um, it'll all feel even more and more real then. <clears throat> yeah. Have you chosen what games you're going to go to yet? I guess you got to wait and see where the fixtures are, right? Yeah, got to wait till the till the schedule comes out and um, and see what games. I'm obviously I'm going to try to go to a Spurs game um, as a Spurs fan, but we'll we'll see exactly which ones and and um, what the schedule looks like, what time works for me to come out there and all. Yeah, well, uh, one thing you mentioned there was just like almost how crazy it was that you actually won it, and I I, I mean that just by where you were with a couple of weeks to go because I've played FPL for a long time and. I think when you start getting to the last kind of four or five weeks, people start tracking who's number one, how many points they are behind. And often it's like a group of people and they've been there for a long time. But if I just pull up your um, kind of end of season quickly on screen, like you were 393rd in game week 35, which is obviously incredible. Um, but most people when they're three weeks out and they're still in triple figures, they don't go on to win. So just, I mean, how ridiculous was those last few weeks? I mean, when did you think you could actually win this? Yeah, I think the last few weeks were just wild. Um, I, I, I thought I was, I was having a great season. I was, you know, earlier when the double started really rolling in, in 26, um, I, I was up there. I was in the top 50. I think I was like 32nd. Um, and, and at that point I had all my chips and I was kind of feeling, Hey, this is, you know, maybe I could do something here. But then as people rolled in all their chips, I step, kept falling back. And then I finally had the chance to, to kind of play mine after, um, after slowly falling. And I, I did terrible with my first free hit. And so I thought it was, it was all gone. Um, but those last couple chips in those last couple weeks, um, man, those were, those were fun and exciting. And, and all the games are on, you know, during the, the weekday games are all in the middle of my work day. Um, so it's like, I'm sitting in a lunch meeting and I'm watching KDB score four goals as I scroll through. It was, it was wild. It was wild. I mean, I mean, you're a Spurs fan, so you're obviously watching football anyway, but did you find you were paying a lot more attention in those kind of last few weeks than that maybe you would usually, or was it all kind of the same? Yeah. I mean, I watch, I watch, you know, Saturday morning, I'm always up watching the games. Um, and usually I'd wake up for a Tottenham game at, you know, it's, I'm on the West coast uh, in California. So it's um, the early games are on at 4am. I sometimes will wake up and watch a Spurs game at 4am, but I wouldn't really watch any other game. And I found myself, all right, like checking team sheets at 3am when the deadline rolls through. And uh, waking up in bed, um, thinking, oh, maybe, yeah, maybe I'll go watch a little bit more, um, getting a little bit more interested. But I, I watch all the, most all the games um, throughout the season, just as a as a fan of the sport. Um, is is that something? Yeah. Sorry, is that something you've always done in in terms of getting up early to check the deadline, or did you only do that towards the end? Because a lot of people ask me. Uh, to ask you, obviously you're, you're in America, just how annoying is kind of the time difference, the deadline time. And obviously for a lot of us, especially those that kind of watch my deadline streams and stuff like that, there often is a little bit of late news that comes in and it, it is an advantage time to time. So I think unless you're up, it's difficult. Yeah, right? I'm, I rarely was up for an actual deadline. I would wake up closer to when the, you know, maybe a half an hour before the game to check the team sheets, but I was not waking up at two 30 to make my transfers uh before before the deadline I, I made all those transfers the night before um it's not it you know I, there's definitely a few times i i think there was when the covid postponements were kind of um really uncertain and i think there was a burnley game that was called off just before the deadline earlier in the season and i remember in that case i did 
you know, set an alarm and wake up early, but that was not a regular thing for me to, to, to make actions bright and early in the morning, unless the deadline was something more like uh, 9 a.m., um, you know, later your grace time. Do, do you think that helped in any way? Because I think a lot of people, like I know myself, when it gets close to the deadline, sometimes it'll be like that transfer you thought about early in the week, suddenly that becomes a really popular one in your mind or someone like, for me anyway, like someone will say something in the chat, like, yeah, I didn't think about that. I know not everyone has to stream close to the deadline, but do you think in some ways it helps that you're not panicking around that time you just got it locked in the night before and just sleep up sleep it off really yeah maybe i, I don't know i guess it's it's uh, i don't know if it helps there wasn't too much stuff that I, I felt like i missed too much late news that i missed out on that would have impacted my decisions across the season maybe one or two here or there um but then again i wasn't i, I don't even know about what the 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 late coming info that I didn't know because I just saw the team sheets when I woke up and that was it, you know? Um, so it's nice to just kind of set it and forget it and kind of be forced to make the move. But I mean, it depends on how you, you know, how you want to play. If you want that like last minute information and, and I'm always been somebody who I like to wait to, to make my transfers closer to the deadline, not at the deadline, but I'm not somebody who's making transfers at the beginning of the, you know, of the week just to get team value because the more information, the more you, you know, the better your decisions can be because you're working with the best information. Um, but yeah, I definitely cut it a little bit short just because of the times. Cool. Yeah. We will definitely come on to um, kind of your strategy uh, a little bit later. What, one question I had is I noticed on your game week history. So this is, is this your third season playing or is this just a new account? It's it's my second, really. Well, the first one I missed the game week one deadline, and I it was oh, okay. I, so um, it it records the history. It makes me look bad, but whatever. Um, so this was my second season. Um, last year was the first time I I really played from the beginning, um, and then this year is the second. So. Did you did you change anything major from last season to this? Year? I mean, obviously, like, I'm sure most people <laughs> who win it will agree. Obviously, you need a tiny bit of luck at least to get to number one, but you still got to make really good decisions. So, did you change anything from last year? Is there anything you consciously made an effort to to think about or differ with your strategy or anything like that? Yeah, I think the first year I I kind of played more. Of, um, you know, I, I didn't consume much content um, across the season. I, I was much riskier and I kind of um, didn't really use statistics much my first year. Um, and so I was kind of making gut decisions all over the place and even captaining kind of very wild um, players this year. Um, I, I kind of, I, over the summer and with the Euros, I kind of got more into fantasy and, and coming into the season had more of a network of, you know, content creators and places to get information, different tools that are out there and started to use those more and more this year to make better decisions, more grounded in statistics and expected goals and positions, touches in the box, that kind of stuff. And, and also kind of pick my battles in terms of, uh, you know, where I take my risks because I was just kind of, throwing things out there hoping hoping they would stick my first year and this year it was more calculated yeah no I I'm, I'm really glad you said that because I think that in in the past anyway and obviously different people win the game in different ways right every season's a little bit different this one was very uh lots of double game weeks and stuff like that. you mentioned the COVID postponements but I think there's definitely a uh, part of the community that still thinks you have to take risks to win like you have to like almost make crazy decisions and you can go a little bit different and we'll, we'll show them in a minute like with your bench boost and you know mm. I, I mean I want to talk about dropping Salah on the 34 wild card later but I think you don't have to go like kind of crazy different what one of the questions that came in as well um was obviously you mentioned that you started listening to more content creators um do you find that you ever get influenced by them a lot of people want, wondered that like if you listen to them and then you kind of you want, might want to go one way and then the, the content creator influences you a different way do you find that or is it more just to kind of get information yeah it was more information i think there's always bias and you can you can be swayed by you know, the community and hence why people jump on certain players and you see, you know, half the, half the game feels like they jump on the same player at the same week at times. Um, and that's because smart people are finding those and, and everybody kind of knows who's, who's good and follows good advice. Um, but I did feel like I was consuming a lot of things, but also making my own decisions. Um, I'm an engineer. I, I 
like to weigh decisions and um, and and make my own decisions and and it's a game and it's fun and you plan your own game and I kind of like to like the idea of playing my own game and and taking risks and going against the crowd at times. Um, so certainly I'd lie if I said that it's you know, that content does not does not convince me or sway me at all. But I do think that I I take in all the different vantage points and try to make my own decisions because um, everybody's team is also so different and with chips and things can be so team dependent just with one different player in your team versus another, the decision may not be the right one. So um, you really got to kind of play your own game with your own team and just use that stuff to, to build a, a framework to, to inform your decision. And did you find that as you got, I mean, I mean, it was a little bit different for you because you kind of just jumped straight to like 10 and then one and one. It wasn't like you were there for a lot of weeks, but did you find at that point that you're either, you watched more or less content or, or, or listened to more or less, however you consumed it. Um, and, and did you find that you started, I, I guess, thinking a little bit more? Like I, I, the reason I asked is because one of my friends was number one for a long time. It was like 17 weeks of a season. And as the season got towards the end, the amount of time you put into the game definitely increased, like massively. Did you find that? I, I think I spent a lot of time thinking about my chips. And so at 34, I felt like I made a lot of my decisions when I built my wild card with the specific things that I was going to do um, going down the wire. Um, so from that perspective, I kind of had a plan for those last weeks, a couple weeks in advance. And I made a lot of decisions at 34 that some of those final things, I mean, even watching your video on um, ahead of 38 and, and trying to pick what transfers we were going to do. I think my team was kind of obvious that I had DS and he was out and the most logical place I could go was to bring in a defender. And, and so I, I think some of my decisions that I made before set me up those last couple of weeks that I didn't have too much tinkering that I had to do. Cause I also didn't want to take too big a risks once you're up there to kind of play around with, um, with going too wild um, and taking hits and things. So um, yeah, I, I'd say it didn't really change too much at the end. It just, I started feeling more pressure. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't even imagine what I would be like. I wouldn't even be sleeping, I don't think, if I was any... I could be the top 100, I probably wouldn't be sleeping. But I know what you mean, though, because on when I wildcarded in game week 26, it was the same. For the next kind of five or six game weeks, most decisions were kind of made for me because I'd set my team up to play a certain amount of game weeks right so i guess it was the same for you for game week 34 we'll we'll, we'll come on to I, I really want to show the bench boots in a set but we'll come on to your team of the season so i'm going to bring that up on screen now so this is just from fpl optimized this is showing the kind of players that got you the most points so it, it's basically like like you said there wasn't really a um any crazy captain. So Salah was captained 11 times. Son was captained four times. The interesting one for me is that Bruno Fernandes shows up three times. And I had a look and you essentially had him in your team. And I think you captained him every single double game week for Man United. So there was game week... Um, I'm going to bring it up now, actually. There was game week 22, where you got 97 points, Captain Fernandez for 46. And then there was the double in 25 and the double in 33. Now, obviously, he didn't do anything in 33 but we, we, are you someone that is kind of influenced by form because a lot of people will say and they, they're still saying it to me now that Man United were rubbish bringing in Fernandez was a bad choice is it just a case of double game which you've got to go for them or, or did you just see something else there yeah I think double game weeks there's just so much value of playing twice and the floor is so much higher than a single game week player that you've got a better chance um, from an odds perspective, just purely statistics to, to get more returns. Menu's not terrible. Um, in those cases, they had at least a good fixture. And so I was targeting the games. Um, I'm more of a fixtures breed form kind of player. And I think and a lot of the a lot of the decisions I make are are looking ahead at fixtures and making sure that we um, that I pick players who have upcoming good fixtures. And double game weeks are are part of that as well. And you know, I, I picked Fernandez maybe because of that first the the twenty two excitement um, in that first double game week where he just kind of lit the lit the world on fire from pretty bad odds. Um, that maybe swayed me into captaining him over Ronaldo in thirty three, maybe. Um, you know, but it either way, it was a menu player. You know, Norwich at home. Um, 
I think it was at home. Maybe it was away. Uh, yeah, yeah, it you, was. Nor- Norwich fixture. You know, you just got to go attack attack those fixtures. Um, Thirty three didn't work out for me, but um, it worked out plenty other times that you know I can't be can't be too critical of myself. <laughs> Plus, you had Ronaldo in 33 as well. I can bring it up here just really quickly. So, yeah, you had Fernandez captain, but you still had Ronaldo in the team. Chris Wood, Wall Prowse, Target got 11 points. So, I mean, obviously, you won it, so you nailed pretty much everything. But I just think it's interesting that even, you know, even the champion still goes for double gaming players like Man United, even if they're not, you know, performing well. And I guess that kind of form versus um, fixtures and stuff comes out a lot. And it's kind of nice to hear someone actually say, well, actually, the fixtures kind of matter quite a lot. Even if they've got to play Liverpool, they've got to play Norwich, one of the worst teams uh, in the league. And another player in your team of the season, which cropped up, which I like, because you got way more points from him than I did, is Reese James. So you, you must have had him for that, you know, that period of time, like around game week eight, where he got like 50 odd points in four weeks. I, I guess you had him there, did you? And did you, when did you captain him? I, I brought him in, in a, in my wild card, my first wild card in, in game week eight. Um, and, and yeah, I had him for a while until he got injured and, um, and pulled him out later. I captained him. I actually captained, captained him in game week nine. Um, so everybody went away from Salah and went to Havertz and I went with Reese James. And so I didn't get the full Havertz uh, six point blank, um, but James scored a goal. And so I, I didn't get hurt too bad from Salah against Man U that week. I, it still wasn't perfect, but um, you know, even when I missed out on the big captaincy hall, I still kind of hit on James, which is was kind of part of that luck. Yeah, I just pulled the team up there on the screen. So you had Reese James captain, 26 points. Obviously, Salah got the 24 against Man United. Um, you even had Huang got eight. Foden, that was the week he got 18 as well. Just absolutely just nailed all those picks. W- that was game week nine, I think you said. So game week eight is when you use your first wild card. Um, and I think big at the back was kind of something that a lot of people use most of the season. But I don't think a lot of people were kind of going five at the back that early on. So you had Chilwell and James. Obviously, had that, they had that really good run before Chilwell, or they both got injured eventually. Trent, Cancelo, and Diaz. Was there anything in particular that made you go for big at the back that early and have the full five? Yeah, I, I was I was looking at you know, the value of, of specifically Chelsea wingbacks. I just thought was just the value was was awesome and then looking ahead at both chelsea and man city's fixtures i just saw a lot of opportunities for clean sheets i think city ended up falling a little shorter of what what we all expected and they let in a couple kind of late goals i remember lanzini scored in like the 90 something minute and wiped away a double clean sheet but but the the value on, on those both those squads and that run of fixtures i felt was in defense um, especially since, you know, Cancelo and Trent and James and Chilwell were all so attacking that they offered just as much value as the, the forwards, um, especially at the price points that they started the season at. You know, I, I expect next season that's going to be a little bit of a trickier decision um, with prices changing. Um, but I think at that point, I just I thought maybe it wasn't something that everybody was going with. Maybe it was an opportunity to, to be a little bit different, but still you know, fairly safe and with a sound structure, um, so, sound foundation in my squad that's going to last for a long period of time at that time, point in the season. And, and so that that could last me to to be able to, to do a late wild card um, with my second one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the team looks really good. And the thing I really like about it is when, when people look at my team, they often like focus on the the biggest weak link. Like they'd look at Mbomo and say he's not great or Huang's not great. But I think those kind of enablers that let you get the team that you want is probably the way to play it. And obviously you then got to prioritize. I mean, I don't, I'm don't, i not really telling you. I'm kind of talking out loud. You've won it, right? You don't need my, my opinion anymore. But um, I think it's really important just to focus on not necessarily the weak things, but where you can get the most points, making sure you've got the right captain mm-hmm. in play Salah Lukaku obviously that didn't work out uh, necessarily for, for most of the season but just having those important pieces in place was kind of good I mean did you, do you ever like like in Bomo Huang Rafinha they did okay at very small periods but do you, do you worry about those weak links like what would be your kind of main transfer priorities when you're looking week to week you know I I think it's it's a balance between you know the whole squad and and you can look at 
you know, pairs and being able to afford higher price, you have to, to cut costs and find cheaper, cheaper players because I didn't have, um, at the same time, I had this back line at five, you know, five premium defenders where most people had four and, and Livermento. And so Livermento allowed them a little bit more budget to, to spread. So I had to make sacrifices um, in some places. Um, and, and so I did, but at the time you, you just try to find the value and whether that be in midfield or forward and f- try to find, you know, where the, the, the players are that can, can, can afford you that flexibility um, in some cases, you know, it, it's not worth going with the multiple premiums and you, you can kind of spread those funds around. Um, but it, it kind of, that is why I, I, I didn't really worry about those because I, the other player that I was able to afford because of it, it's a balance between the two. Yeah, no, I, re- I really I like, that, like, I thought that they could, they could still support and still get points. It wasn't, you know, Hoang was still starting and, and scoring goals at that time. So it wasn't like he was just this terrible weak link looking ahead further down the, the season and looking back. Yeah. He didn't do great over the course of the season, but I got rid of him shortly after. And so um, I was able to, to plug in, I, I pulled him in Broha and Broha was scoring goals for fun at that point of the season too. Um, so you kind of just march along and, and find where that value is, um, how best to optimize and shift dollars around in your squad to, to find the value and, and kind of maybe do things a little differently, which I thought was kind of fun. Yeah, for sure. I think this game week eight wildcard was kind of like the catalyst for your season because in game week seven, when that finished, you were 248k. When you went into game week eight, you you went up to 120. And then after that, in game week nine, it was like 38k. And the, the rises just kept happening there. And I think you got your first triple figures in game week 20, which was 888. And then if I just pull up the kind of end of the season, so I've got on screen now game week 25 onwards so what you said earlier it was game week 26 when you first got into double figures which is 33rd obviously uh salad triple captain like a lot of people did um which worked out really well he did amazing that week um and then it was kind of good for the rest of the season um but a lot of it was kind of triple figures so you kept all your chips i'm going to bring it up actually um you kept pretty much all your chips from game week 33 onwards so game week 8 was the first wild card 26 was triple captain but then both free hits what uh the second wild card and bench boost were all after game week 33 was that a kind of conscious decision to smash the end of the season when we knew there'd be double game weeks was it just that your team was well set up for the 20 because 26 to 30 was a big period for a lot of people was it just well set up or, or or how did you kind of manage that or how did you decide which way to play it yeah um i think the my initial thought was always i wanted to use the wild card in and around um, you know, 33, 34, 35 to set up for, um, to take advantage of the big 36 double game week um, and with my bench boost. So those two chips, I kind of always had in my mind that I wanted to save for later. Um, but I was also a little flexible if things happened, if my team wasn't set up, I could have pivoted. Um, but that was always in mind. Those two chips later attacked the, the doubles that we knew were for sure going to happen. Um, and then the two free hits, I was kind of, wanting to use them in an opportunity that my team wasn't set up well for. And, and I think it's, it's really team dependent. You can have a week where there's blanks or a week where there's not many double game weeks that is good for your team and the way that your team is set up. And so I was, those two, I was really flexible on and I wanted to originally attack 27 because Liverpool and Arsenal blanked. So I was planning to free hit there to, to cover, but then I ended up not getting as many, um, Arsenal and Liverpool players in my team at, at that week. So I I felt like I could, I could manage it. I benched, you know, I had four Liverpool players or in Arsenal players on my bench. I think I rolled out 10, um, starters in 27 and I felt my team's decently set up for this. Uh, I'll be fine. I think I ended up, you know, not doing terrible. I dropped a bit, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't bad. Um, and then I thought, okay, well, 30 is also another opportunity where a lot of people are, are trying to attack that, um, that blank, maybe I'll save it for there. And I ended up finding a way to get both Kane and son in my squad, just as my base squad. So again, I felt like my team for my team, it didn't make as much sense to, to gain as much from the free hit in those circumstances. 
So when I, as my team was kind of continuing to progress, I, I kind of shifted where I wanted to use those free hits um, and, and pick 33 and then um, 37 uh, as the next double game week is both those two opportunities had higher potential to, to gain over my regular team. And, and so I kind of shifted those back a little bit, but that wasn't always the intent um, with those free hits. Yeah, you just play it as you go, really, right? If, if things have started going bad, I'm sure maybe you would have reassessed. But I think, like, having, I've just, while you were talking now, I was pulling up the, the teams on screen. So I pulled up the game week 27. So I think you got about 54 points. But I remember free hitting that week, and I didn't get much more than that because everything that we all hoped would happen just didn't. And then yeah, your game City, with- I think everybody jumped on Mares and yeah. Mares much and i think city left let in a goal yeah but it was yeah. not not ideal and then i've got your game week 30 team up now where you got son 15 points obviously harry kane captain big spurs fan so i'm sure you're happy about how the uh the season ended for sure so I, i'm going to skip game week 33 because we kind of briefly talked about i think it, we, we've seen that team um quite a lot let's talk about the game week 34 wild card right so uh, quite a few people did it the the thing for me was I checked this morning before we recorded is you drop Salah for Mane and it, unless I'm misremember I mean Salah was fully fit at that point I think right so was there a reason why you dropped Salah for Mane obviously it worked out really well I'm just trying to get the thinking behind it yeah I'm trying to remember I think I maybe dropped Salah a couple weeks but right but not just the week right before but it maybe was two weeks before um when he was playing City and it's so a 34. I, I was looking at, all right, I'm, I'm, I dropped out of the top thousand. Now I'm at sitting at 700 or something like that. I, um, I can't remember exactly, but I was, I was looking at the players that I could fit into the squad and trying to play with money and, and figure out all the different combinations that would make um, to attack kind of the last couple of game weeks. And I kept looking at kind of the, I, I put together kind of a pool of players that I would like in my team. Um, and this included a pool from city, a pool from Liverpool, Chelsea, um, Spurs, uh, a, a bunch of the, the main people, who, teams who had good fixtures and doubles in 36 um, and decent fixtures the rest of the season. And as I kind of played with those combinations um, I also thought of, well, if I want to, you know, this is kind of the pivot point of my season. If I want to kind of push forward and, you know, risk it all to, to gain a lot and, you know, what would be fun um, result at the end of the season? For me, a fun result would be something like push into the top, getting into single digits into the top 100, I think was my goal at that time. That would be fun. I'd like to say that rather than, um, you know, sitting in and around the same area that I was. So I decided to kind of take a few risks and use that budget um, to basically take the premium mid- Liverpool players and knock it down one notch um, in terms of price point. <clears throat> so I went with Van Dyke, I went with Matip, and I went with Mane, both just a tier below the main three of Trent Robertson and, uh, and Salah. And so those three allowed me to kind of push more funds throughout my team and get KDB and son Reese James and Alonzo. I, I was able to fill out my squad with a bunch of um, players that other people couldn't afford because they had a lot more money tied up in Robbo and, um, and Trent and Sala. But that also gave me an opportunity. If my players do well and the, those players I don't have um, don't, I could rise up because I'm going going against ownership. Um, So it was a bit of a game of if I want to push on and get what I wanted in a a good goal, a fun finish, I had to take some risks. And it just so happened that the risks that I took ended up working out perfectly. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, But I know that doesn't always work and it doesn't always work out that way. And you have to acknowledge that doing that risk will very possibly knock you down. And at that point in the season, to me, it was worth the risk to try to push forward and, and find some ways, different avenues to points. Um, and yeah, it, rest is history. Yeah, but I think yeah, look, I think you're right. I mean, usually, like I'm sure in game week one, if they're similar price, we'll probably all go for Trent and Robertson over Van Dyke and Matip. But it's like you said, <clears> at some point, you've got to make a decision about how much you want to push. And there's only a few weeks left, right? And it, I think this is what I always try and talk about with differentials. 
it's not like you've picked really bad players for the sake of it, right? You've still got Liverpool defenders in there. Yes, okay, Matip had a ridiculous end to the season and maybe there's a little bit of luck there, but it's not like you've gone and put in a, I don't know, a Brighton defender and just hope for the best. You know, say, same with getting De Bruyne, Mane and Son. That's three big hitters and you're exactly right. I, for my team, my team value wasn't great, but I had Trent, I had Robertson. There was no way I was going to get a third premium in there. Just no way, not without major reshuffle. So, yeah, it might have been a gamble, like you said. But, um, I mean, well, first of all, it obviously paid off really nicely. But I think there was some good thought behind it. Do you know what I mean? I think some people just, when they think they need to go different, they just start thinking a little bit crazy. Like, Mane's a great player. De Bruyne is a great player. Van Dyke, etc. All good. So, I, I really like that. I think, and obviously, it, it played out really well. I'm going to bring up the... Game week 36 bench boost, which was just crazy. So just a quick reminder, I'm going to bring it up actually first. Um, so this is um, the rank history. So in game week 35, you were 393rd, and the bench boost took you to 10th in the world. So it was 201 points, I think. Is that right? I believe it was. Yeah, 201. Just, just enough, I think. D Dennis got two points in that double game week, and I, I give Dennis the credit to just pushing me over the 200 200 point mark <laughs> you remember him he, for, for a lot of people he's a bit of a troll but for you he'll always be uh be a legend for getting into that 200 <laughs> miles i've never done that in 11 years never seen 200 points i mean the, the we've just talked about the wild cards so we don't need to go for all the players again there's two kind of main questions for me is one what made you bring in luis diaz for Havertz? um and two, was De Bruyne always going to be the captain? Because obviously you're a Spurs fan. Son have been playing brilliant. I know he had Liverpool as one of the fixtures. Was that part of the reason you went for De Bruyne? Like, what was the thinking there? Yeah, uh, I'll start answer the first one with Luis Diaz. Um, I think, I can't remember exactly, but in 35, I think I moved Van Dijk out for another City defender. I think it was Diaz at that time. Um, and his DS was back healthy and I shifted some of that money. Um, and, you know, Havertz was kind of falling out of, uh, out of favor with Tuchel. And so I, I thought I can do a, a bit of a swap and restructure and Liverpool had, had Tottenham. Um, so I, I hate kind of doing that where I've got my own players playing against my own, my own fantasy defenders a bit. So a little bit of Spurs bias played into it, but I, I did that shuffle so that I could get another Liverpool attacker. I felt like they had goals in their games. And so I brought in Luis Diaz because um, it felt like he was going to get some starts um, that week. It was, it was a bit of an expected minutes kind of a move um, kind of trying to calculate who was going to, who's going to play more. Um, and on the, the captaincy decision, I, I had actually captained KDB in game week 35 and KDB didn't play a minute. And so my captaincy shifted to my vice captain, which was son. And I got an extra 19 points. Um, so a, a beautiful <laughs> it's a sequence of events that, you know, KDB is now rested and going into this double game week with better fixtures than Tottenham. Um, it was, it, to me, it was close. I did think about Sun, but um, it was it was kind of always going to be KDB because of the the fact he was rested and it felt like he was going to be playing more minutes. Um, never would have ever thought that he would have done what he did against Wolves. Um, you know, but the first game, I thought he could have gotten way more, um, which is, it's an interesting balance. He, he, he could have had six assists, um, maybe not that many, but four assists in that first mean. game. Um, so it, 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 it was, I, th I felt like it was the right decision going into the week. And then, um, and then, you know, the, the 30 points was more than anybody could have expected. Was there any thought, bearing in mind, I mean, I mean, you can answer a question actually from the community, which is about, do you ever take effective ownership into account? So just how much a player is owned by the rest of the community. Was there any ever thought at this stage of getting Salah back, knowing that he would be so kind of heavily captained for this double? No, I know. I, not not bringing in solid just because the the price point. I'd have to do too much surgery at that point to my team to be able to fit him in, and and I had already kind of spread the money around. It, it would have been you know taking money out f and somebody else maybe at a hit just to get solid to to protect it. It wasn't something that I was looking at doing, um, and and again I, I was going into this week. I was still in the 
three, you know, almost 400, 390. Right. And so I, I still hadn't reached that goal of, I want to, I want to, what, what would make this season fun is if I pushed on um, a lot farther and got to the top hundred and making that move to Sala wouldn't have done that for me. Um, even if he did well, you know, everybody had him. So it, it, from an effective ownership perspective, I wasn't going to gain as much. Um, so I, I like playing the game of um, a little bit different and, and I never really enjoyed the part of the season where everybody was captain in Salah. He, he was, he was the right decision all, all those times. Um, but it, it just, it's not as fun um, of a game. I love when people are taking different avenues and um, the end part of the season with everybody's team, different, everybody playing different chip strategies. Um, the weeks when he's out, everybody's trying to figure out right, who's the best captaincy option. That, that part's, I think a lot of fun. Um, and so I did, uh, you know, I, I was I, from my wild card, I was always kind of playing against effective ownership. Um, and that was part of part of the if I want to make the gains and, and do what I want um, at this point in the season, I, I have to. Otherwise, you're, you're kind of just going along with the crew. Yeah, for sure. And, and again, like it works out so nicely. And I think that kind of I think the way it sounds like you play the game is actually quite good for the end of the season because I think that, like I said earlier, that is the time where you need to decide how much you want to push it. Like if you if you were like me, you were just going for top ten k. I didn't really need to go too massively different, and I was never going to get number one at that point anyway. Um, but I guess if you are pushing like you were for triple digits, then you got to think about how you can go different. So yeah, that was nicely played. Uh, game week thirty seven. I don't want to skip over it completely because it was a great week. It was over a hundred points. Richarlison captain, Madison and Vardy. Like I think that was kind of the semi template for that week my main question really for 37 and then game week 38 which i'm going to bring up on screen your game week 38 team is at this point you're obviously 10th in the world then you're first then you're first are you starting to look at the other teams in the top 10 to, to make your moves to think about what they might be doing is that coming into your onto your radar yeah, for, for sure. At least in 37, I was, I was definitely like, okay, who's got a free hit left? Um, yeah, I think at that point, I was still 30 something points back in going into 37. So I, I still had 30 something points is a lot. Um, if, if the person in number one is, is doing average, you still got to beat the average by 30 points. It's, it's kind of a lot. So I figured I had to take a few risks, even in 37. And, and, you know, a lot of people weren't going for all the, the lesser um, assets because they thought that they were, weren't were going to play. And um, I, But I thought, you know, that first game against Watford was just, you know, might as well go for it and it worked out. And then certainly in the last week, when you go, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm sitting in first place going into the last week, I got one transfer to use. I could use more and, and take a hit, but if if you're not looking at other teams and seeing what you can, what else they can do, um, you're not doing due diligence. And um, I my for what I had to do, my decisions, I probably would have made the same decisions even if I didn't look at other teams. Um, but it still helped to inform kind of what I was going to do and where I would, you know, where I would be exposed in that last week. What risks. Um, what, you know, circumstances or, or events are going to be damaging to me. And, um, and so, yeah, I definitely looked through the, the top 10, top five folks and made sure that um, I understood, you know, where I could be hurt going into that week. Cause it just also helped navigate the actual day of the final day, <clears throat> knowing <throat> what's going on around and what's actually hurting, what can hurt me. Um, it was, it was pretty hectic seeing with, you know, 10 games going on at the same time. I was in a bar watching um, with some friends and family and, um, and I actually met up with um, a, a handful of uh, Twitter folks um, in an FPL meets organized by um, FPL Black Wolf, Dan. Um, and so that was, it was a lot of fun atmosphere, but it was also very hectic with, uh, you know, a goal goes up over there and you're like, oh, wait, who's, who scored? Like, oh, and I'm watching, you know, Tottenham, but I'm also watching Liverpool because I've got, um, I was kind of understanding what I had versus what Savanch had and what the other folks had that could hurt me. And, and then I, I missed some of the goals in the Tottenham game and it'd be like, Oh, was it, was it Kane? No, like, Oh, okay. Kane was involved, but it was just an assist. And, um, so it was pretty stressful and hectic uh, that actual during those games. Um, but at least I, I kind of knew what, what was going to damage me going into it. Uh, 
which yeah. made it a little. I think yeah, mm. I think you had to know going into there. I think I, I don't think I could have gone in not knowing. I think it, it, I guess it makes it a little bit more painful if their players start scoring, but at least you kind of know what the the outcome was. And I think you said I did that video in the last week, and I I, I always thought your the obvious move was just to get Cecily on and let other people like try and you know catch you i guess and maybe make the mistake because you, you captain saw and i think if we're like he was the obvious captain in game week 38 right he had norwich he's been playing really well um and i think at that point most people are happier to go with him over kane did you ever have a think about going different or did you just think i'll let everyone else try and catch me it was i was I was maybe 95% on Sun the whole way. I, I thought, okay, KDB could on the last day, big game, winning the title, could do some magic. But it was it was Sun, and and I feel like if I went against Sun as a yeah. Spurs fan in the final day and I lost FPL, um, that would have that would have hurt twice as much. <laughs> um, so I I kind of stuck with my guns and stuck with who who the main captaincy option because I figured. Our teams are different enough um, on a handful of players that the people below me would probably stick with Sun and try to use different um, different avenues of differentials to my team to try to catch up to me. Um, so I, it, it would have been a risk that was at that point too much. If I was further back, say fifth place going into the last week, I would have maybe thought differently. But um, in first, it was yeah, Sun all the way. Yeah, I, I got to be honest, when I did that video, like, I, I don't know if I said it, but I did think you were probably going to win because I think the rest of them just had had to do something. You didn't really need to do anything. You already had Son in place and you had the boring, which people were thinking about as like still bringing in as a differential because of that massive haul against Wolves. And you had Manny in there as well, who again is one of those players that a lot of people look to at the end of the season. So uh, it would have been, it would have had to have been something um, kind of special, I think, for you to be caught at that point. Like kind of, all the work had gone in with that 36 bench boost and 37 uh, free hit, which yeah. were just amazing scores. How did you celebrate? I, um, you know, I, I took a shot of tequila right after the win um, with my family. That was, that was fun. Um, and I, I came back to my place. I have a, a one-year-old, a 14-month-old son. Um, so he was there with my wife um, just outside the bar. Um, so I went over and kind of celebrated with him a little bit, um, which was fun. He had no idea what was going on. Um, tell him and, one day that's a nice story to tell later on. Exactly. In life. Yeah. Um, and then I came back to my place and, uh, a couple of my neighbors, um, were outside and we got to celebrate. It was fun. Good stuff. I actually, I'm just looking through all the questions. I think we've pretty much covered it from what we've talked about. I guess the one question on here that I've not really asked is out of all the decisions you made, and obviously you made a lot of good decisions this season, right? Which do you think was the best one? Or was there a particular point where you think that just kind of drove the rest of the season on? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. Being in this position, I think it's clear a lot of decisions went right. And so it's kind of hard to pick um, a specific decision. I think the the best decision I felt was my early wild card, which really I felt set my whole season up for success and put me in a, even in a position to to be able to to go for it at the end. But obviously, I, I mean, you can't the luck of the 35, 36 captaincy choices and KDB switching to sun and, um, and then KDB just going on that massive, um, massive four goal game. That's hard to overlook as just, you know, you see where the, where I gained the most and in, in that, that week was really telling. Yeah. Um, I, th I think both wild cards were like really well played. Like I wild card in game week seven. And I think at that point, Chill and James might've been semi fit or something. I had Asper Laquette and Rudiger and that just kind of destroyed me. If I'd gone that week later, I may have gone kind of James and Chill as well. And that would have, oh, I obviously wouldn't have been enough to win, but it would have, um, yeah, it definitely helped a bit. So that was really nice. And obviously the 34, all the decisions around um, the differentials and having to chase ground. I think like, both wild cards just went perfect. Jamie, thank you very much for joining me. That was a pleasure. Appreciate it, Andy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Congratulations. Oh, actually, last question while well, I just thought of it. Because what mm -hmm. my mate, like I said, who was number one for ages, he then basically quit after that. Like you can't well, you can win FPL again, but you can never better number one. And it's, and it's pretty difficult, I would say, to win it again. How are you feeling about next season? Like knowing that you can't really top what you've done? Yeah, I mean my goal was never to win FPL in the first place. So my goal is to have fun. I love watching the games. Um, and I, I also have a bit of an addictive personality and getting into the strategy. And I, I just, 
as I got deeper and deeper into FPL, I found it more and more um, you know, rewarding and, um, and and thrilling. So I don't, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I'm definitely gonna gonna keep playing, and um, I gotta I gotta at least defend. Exactly. See, see if I could do the the unthinkable. Um, you know, knowing that it's very 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 almost virtually impossible. Um, but let's see what happens. Um, never know. That that would be amazing. I think for so, at some point maybe someone will win it twice, and that will be uh, yeah, that will then probably be impossible to beat. I think in our lifetimes, it's just so hard to win. Look, congratulations again. Thank you very much for coming on. If you did enjoy that, obviously make sure to give Jamie a follow. I'll leave Twitter links and stuff like that uh, in the description below. Give it a like, hit that subscribe button, and we'll catch you again soon. Cheers.